chingada, brujo, falta una copera. Está aquí por eso, está aquí por eso. Está aquí por eso. Aquí tengo su hueso, cabrones. Este cojas de España. Vamos a tocar. Bienvenidos cabrones, una vez más pinches marihuanos, aquí estamos, Mr. Waga, representando Waga Weed, un nuevo programa, One Joint Talk, otro nuevo episodio con un invitado donde nos fumamos un caña, un buen joint, fumamos un poquito y hablamos sobre lo que está pasando, esta vez tenemos un invitado especialísimo, una leyenda de la música extrema, más de 30 años encima del escenario, más de 30 años fumando marihuana con todos ustedes, un titán de lo extremo, el señor Danny Lelker. <clears throat> What's up, Danny? How you doing? Okay, man. How are you doing, man? Everything good. Just ready to light the joint and start talking with you. So this is called One Joint Talk. So let's start uh, lighting our weapons. Okay, so today um, I have a pipe. That, so it's gonna be a one pipe talk. <laughs> let's do it, Danny. Okay. Mm. Wake and bake. Yeah, pretty much. It's a little after 1 p.m. So normally during the day, I'm a, I'm kind of an angel and I wait till the night. But it's also today is my day off, so this is permitted. Amazing. So, Danny, um, how are you doing in this crazy pandemic times? What have you been up to? Um, I'm doing okay, thank you. Uh, I am healthy. I even had a test a couple of weeks ago to make sure. And obviously I'm not doing any shows <laughs> with any bands I'm in, but I have a, I've had a full-time job at a record store here in Rochester, New York for over three years now called the record archive. And we had to temporarily uh, close the store in March. And then we had a gradual reopening in May, and then at the beginning of June, we went back to uh, normal, allowing people in the store for shopping. So I've been working. So I consider myself lucky. Obviously, there's a lot of people not working now. So I've been doing that. And it's okay because I stopped doing full-time touring a few years back. So this is actually a good situation. I feel bad for my friends who are touring all the time, like the guys in, let's say, Napalm Death or Mayhem or Immolation. But uh, I had a plan to stop touring and just get a normal, cool job. So I'm okay. Right on. So what are you smoking, Danny? Well, I got this from a friend of mine. And I cannot tell you if it is indica or sativa. I am not an expert on this stuff. I can tell you it smells very good and it's very strong. <laughs> Amazing. Um, let's talk about what have you been doing with music in the last uh, times. I saw that cover you did of uh, Speak uh, English or Die that you renamed. I speak Spanish or die together with Charlie Venante, Billy Milano, Scott Ian, a special guest Mike Patton. How how did that happen? How how you started doing that video and that cover for the SOD classic? Well, uh, actually, I should say that uh, Billy Milano was not participating, which is why we got Mike to sing. Okay. So, uh, but it's just the one vocalist. Well, that was after some other videos that we had done, when all this quarantine stuff started happening, Charlie Benante um, had already been doing quarantine videos, actually with some people from uh, down there in Chile who are helping him with the production. Yeah, so the director, right, is from Chile. See, sí. so after they were doing that, there was the idea, let's do some SOD songs, but uh, Billy was not so interested at the time, so we said, okay, we'll do the March of the SOD, which has no lyrics. And then we did Chromatic Death, which has a very small amount of lyrics, just uh, two words, actually, which are the <laughs> titles, so that was easy. 
And then um, the idea came to get some other vocalists involved with some other songs. So we actually did a couple of Discharge covers with Randy from Lamb of God singing. Amazing. And then uh, we did a... Uh, <clears throat> Scott had been playing with Mr. Bungle, so he already had a relationship do, playing live shows with Mr. Bungle earlier this year. So they had been playing Speak English or Die live with mm -hmm. Mr. Bungle. So this was a natural choice when we were going to do another SOD song since uh, Mike had already sang it. And due to his half Chilean heritage, he decided to change it to Speak Spanish or Die. And yeah. we thought that was fine because, of course, you have to realize the original lyrics were just a provocation and nobody in the bands were actually, you know, <laughs> racists or whatever. So I, it was uh, pretty cool that he did his own creative thing with that. Amazing. Let's uh, talk back about marijuana and especially about your first experiences with the weed. What do you remember of though that first joint or that first time you smoke? Uh, well, I was very young and I was actually introduced to it by my sister. <laughs> no, no longer with us, uh, but at the time she was about eight years older than me and she kind of got me into music and weed. She got me into playing music because if you look in my biography, which I know not everybody has read, you'll see that she wanted a piano in the house when we were young and then she never played it. So I started playing it. Same with guitar. So not only did she get me into playing musical instruments, but she also got me into 60s classic rock along with smoking. You know, and this is, of course, Hendrix, Cream, The Who, The Beatles. And of course, you know, The Beatles after Rubber Soul, they were all you know, they weren't so innocent anymore. And yeah. you know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, I was introduced to all this stuff simultaneously by my sister. So she obviously played a very important role in my life. Because uh, obviously at the time, smoking and listening to psychedelic music when I was 12 years old, like Hendrix and Cream was uh, uh, pretty interesting. So cool, man. Um, let's talk about your career. One of the bands you have been playing for a lot of years and now you stop touring with them is Brutal Truth. Um, that actually we shared um, uh, the last European tour together. What, what are your memories from that, that last tour? Ah, you were stressing about Hellfest, remember? <laughs> I remember. Every time you show up to Hellfest, it's never a problem. They send 10,000 emails like, you must be here at this time and you can only have this room for two hours and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then you get there and they're like, no, don't worry about that. Just show up whenever you want and here, you can stay here. And, um, no, I remember the last tour for Brutal Truth in Europe was meaningful for me because I was the one who made the decision not to tour anymore when I was turning 50. So I know it was... I'm the bad guy, kind of. So I wanted to make sure everybody enjoyed themselves. And it was uh, very uh, therapeutic because for me, I was just really getting tired of touring. It wasn't playing on stage. It was the traveling. Getting to uh, where you were trying to go was becoming very stressful. And you know what I'm talking about. Sure. You had to pick people up at airports when their flights are delayed eight hours or you've you've shared these experiences. So you know the frustration when uh, all you want to do is get where you're going on time with your clothes and your musical instruments. And that becomes a big problem. In fact, a year ago from right now, one year previous, Nuclear Assault was doing shows in South America and yeah. we had massive problems arriving and leaving. And I was in Peru for the first time ever for a period of maybe nine hours from midnight till nine in the morning. And I played a show and I did not get to see anything except at night. So uh, the original question you asked is that I have great memories of the last Brittle Truth tour in Europe. And, you know, it's kind of uh, happy and sad at the same time, but 
it's what had to happen. Great. Uh, most most people think that uh, when you're on tour, everything is super cool. But uh, most of the time, you are in a van, in a bus, uh, <laughs> and it's a bit of pain on the ass. But those uh, 45, 60 minutes on stage are worth it. So uh, th thank you for your commitment with the uh, uh, stream metal community and all what you have been doing for since you started playing guitar and bass, drums, whatever. So um, let's get back to Mari. When a, a lot of states um, in, a, <clears throat> in the US are starting to legalize marijuana, everything is getting more normal, more accepted. Um, uh, a lot of people is growing their own plants. Uh, what's, what's your opinion on, on this new um, a scene on, with the marijuana legally in the states. Uh... Well, as you know, we have 50 states. So the way it's working now is that there is no uh, unifying federal law on legalization. It is up to the states to make their own decisions. So yes, there's been a lot of states that have gone for the full on recreational, meaning you do not have to have a medical condition or a card and the state that is bordering us, Massachusetts, to our east, currently has this policy. New York, uniquely enough, has this kind of half-assed thing right now. In New York, it is decriminalized, which is kind of like a baby step compared to other states like Colorado, you know, but um, we'll take what we can get. This, the definition of this means that you would have to have a lot of it on you and you know be in your car to uh get in trouble i think if you have less than like 27 grams then it's okay and if you're driving around with that much then obviously you're uh, like snoop dogg or something <laughs> so uh yeah but yeah um i think it's positive that people that the states are doing this because not just for the enjoyment but also because um those states that have enacted these policies have had um, a very good increase in their financial. Uh, in other words, they're able to uh, take care of a lot of issues that they have. They've, in Colorado, they took a lot of that money and put it into the education system. So it's uh, also become a good, profitable venture for states that, you know, have ridiculous expenses they have to take care of so uh there's that whole side to it too not just the woohoo you know interesting yeah all the tax money from the weed and everything yeah yes everything is is interesting about it uh talking about your musical career as you mentioned before another band you have been playing it's nuclear assault and it's crazy that now in this uh crazy political social uh, health times uh, we are living that the lyrics of nuclear assault are still so relevant right yeah um sometimes it's almost sad to say things like that but uh it is true that when you write a song in 1987 and it still makes sense i mean some songs should make sense just because the lyrics are cool but direct specific stuff you know, about uh, the dangers of nuclear war, you know, it's, it's different than it was, it was back in the 80s, of course. You had Ronald Reagan then. Right now you have Donald Trump, uh, hopefully not much longer, but I'm not here to talk politics. Uh, but no, uh, when you're writing lyrics about environmental mayhem and, you know, just using your brain, thinking for yourself, not just being a robot and all that stuff still is very relevant now. And I guess in a way it always should be. Yeah, man. Um, some years ago, you released uh, the book, your biography, Perpetual Conversion, 30 Years and Counting in the Life of Metal Veteran Dan Lilker, together with Dave Hoover. Uh, how was the experience of working on this book and how was the reaction about it? Well, definitely doing the whole book 
was something, although I'd been on many records and played in many bands, this was a whole different thing. And Dave, the author, he really gets the credit for doing all the work. I just answered all his questions. And the way it worked is he just would fly out from Chicago to Rochester for a week, um, some weekends and just do these mega long interviews where he would just try to ask me about all these experiences. Then he would reach out to other people that were involved. And that could be anybody from my mom to uh, Fenris. So my book's the only one to have my mom and Fenris in it. And uh, <laughs> also amazing. we went through all my laminates from tours and posters and tour books and just attempted to take it chronologically, you know, from when I was a child up to when we stopped doing all that stuff in like, I think 2012 or 13 is when we had the cutoff point and let's start the book or else this will go on forever. And uh, yeah, put it all together. It took a little while to find a publisher that was dedicated to releasing it, but we did. And the reaction seems to be um, quite positive. A lot of people who have read the book said, you know, this is really cool because, you know, I don't want to go into ego territory here, but people are like, I've always enjoyed everything you've done. So it was really cool to see all this in a book. And, you know, you're a, you're a nice guy and not a rock star and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was unique in that it was almost like making a solo record. All the attention and focus <laughs> is on me. It's not me and three other guys playing music. So. In that way, it was like being under a harsh spotlight, but that's part of it. Yeah. So, uh, Danny, my joint is almost gone. Uh, this, uh, so it's called One Jump Talk. So when the joint ends, we end the, the conversation. So my last question will be, will be uh, what are you going to do when all this bullshit uh, COVID-19 ends and uh, what are your near future plans or uh, next plans when this is over, when this health crisis is over? Well, the first thing that's going to happen when all this is over is that Nuclear Assault is going to play our show here in Rochester that was canceled because it was fucking April 18th. Okay. And we were selling a lot of tickets for it at the record store I work at. You know, okay. some guy comes in with a punch and stench shirt and go, hey, dude, can I get a ticket to your show? And of course, as everybody in the world knows, by mid-March, one month before this show was supposed to occur, this is when the shit hit the fan. Yeah. So all shows were canceled. I have spoke with the venue guy. And so one thing that's going to happen when all this is over is that a bunch of shows that were canceled or postponed are going to happen again. So that's going to be almost funny in a hectic way that everyone's going to be, okay, can we play? No, you have to wait till next week. You know, all these other bands. On a personal level, I am going to enjoy going to go on vacation with my wife and get to travel outside the country. We live two hours from the Canadian border and we can't even go into there. And I understand why they're doing that, because the Canadians have been a lot smarter and safer dealing with all this stuff. You know, uh, they don't have a president who says you can drink detergents or something. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, going to enjoy going to shows, going to bars with my friends, playing shows that are supposed to happen. You know, I'm traveling shows, a little nuclear bit. Nuclear Assault was supposed to play in Mexico next month. And... Uh, so, and just enjoying life without having to wear a mask everywhere. Yeah. I don't mind wearing a mask because I understand why. I'm not one of these anti-maskers complaining about my freedom. You know, it's, that is a very selfish and stupid attitude because the whole point is that it is a contagious and a lethal disease. So don't be a pendejo. <laughs> That's right. No sean pendejos y usen la máscara, cabrones. Uh, Danny, it's been a pleasure having you. This is my last hit. And I will have my this... last hit here. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, it's almost gone. Or... It's the visual. Totally gone. 
It's it is. Yep, and now we go shopping. Yeah. It'll be fun. <laughs> so, Danny, thank you very much. Okay, uh, it's been an honor. This has been One John Talk Cabrones, a kick on Danny Lilker, the brutal truth, nuclear assault, SOD, anthrax, un montón de bandas. Esto ha sido One John Talk. Y aquí nos despedimos, amigos. Hasta pronto. Síganos en las redes Wakawi TV, cabrones. Mother,